Thanks so much, Mike. Um, thank you for putting together this awesome series. Uh, it's really an honor to be a part of it. And um, yeah, thanks to you and all the organizers for, for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I'm really excited to share this work. Uh, it's, um, this is a, a, a novel approach to thinking about correlators into sitter. Um, and uh, the work is now out on the archive. It should be in JHEP soon enough. Uh, and is uh, in collaboration with uh, the truly great Dan Green, uh, who's a professor at uh, UC San Diego. Um, and he brings the cosmology expertise to this collaboration. Um, OK, so let's get into it. Um, here's kind of a basic sketch of what I'm going to be up to today. I'm interested in taking the low energy limit in De Sitter and um, in terms of physical coordinates, we can think about uh, there being some physical wave number or momentum set by k over a, where a is the scale factor. And um, in De Sitter, there's a natural scale set by the Hubble constant, which is dimensionful. And so, as you can imagine, there's a limit you can take, a ratio between these dimensionful scales, basically taking k over a much, much less than h. And that's the long wavelength limit of De Sitter. Um, it's interesting for a variety of reasons, both uh, a little bit more theoretical in exploring field theory in De Sitter, but uh, also um, it's these long wavelength modes, which are the, uh, the fluctuations from inflation that freeze out and ultimately come back into our horizon and see the structure uh, that you know, makes us up. Um, that, that's everything that we observe today. And so, we um, understanding this limit is uh, very relevant to uh, the universe we live in. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to integrate out short distance modes and we're going to be left with a long distance theory. It'll be written in terms of two degrees of freedom. Uh, so I'll use these var phi's for the EFT modes. And I'll describe, of course, in great detail where these come from, but there will be a mode phi plus uh, it's the phi plus correlators that are the ones we're actually interested in. And then there will be this other field around phi minus who uh, will kind of play an auxiliary role in a sense, but is really there to uh, keep the action local. And, uh, and, and as you'll see, it's kind of critical to make everything work out, even though it doesn't appear in the correlators we'll compute. The symmetries. There's going to be space-time symmetry. The isometries of De Sitter will play a big role in constraining the form of the effective theory. Uh, there will also be a reparameterization symmetry, uh, very closely analogous to what happens in, for example, heavy quark effective theory. Um, there are a lot of analogies to be made with heavy quark effective theory, and I'll, I'll try to make those clear as I move through the talk. Um, and then the last piece that you need to set everything up uh, is something that, uh, at least to my knowledge, is kind of novel to De Sitter, which is that you also need to specify initial conditions. Uh, if you like, those are set at this horizon, uh, which is set by the Hubble scale. Okay, So I'll get into that again in, in great detail as we get into the talk. OK, so what are the kind of questions we're interested in asking? Well, we want to understand uh, what happens in this infrared limit in De Sitter. Okay, and of course, I don't have to convince this audience that the right way to think about these questions is by taking an effective field theory approach, because it gives us these conceptual advantages. Right, we can ask what are the degrees of freedom that emerge. I've already told you it's going to be that phi plus and phi minus fields. What governs their dynamics? Well, it's going to be uh, the symmetries that um, that again I, I showed in the last slide, uh, and we'll be able to derive a unique. Uh, leading order quadratic action that governs the dynamics. Um, and of course, understanding the symmetries that persist into the IR is critical to understanding what form our observables will take, in this case, the um, NN correlators. There's also some real practical advantages to taking these IR limits. We understand how operators are organized using some kind of power counting scheme. There's this technical issue, which is how to just deal with divergent integrals. Um, I'll highlight briefly that that turns out to be kind of a subtle thing in De Sitter. And so we have a new idea about how to deal with divergences. And once you've properly separated scales, then your IR logs of the full theory become UV logs of the EFT, and you can use RG techniques to sum them. And we'll take advantage of that in this EFT as well. 
Okay, so what are we trying to do? We're trying to address some major confusions that appear in the literature in trying to explore this late time long wavelength behavior of the so-called in-in correlation functions. So I won't go into detail of how these correlation functions are calculated. I'll flash some expressions as we go along. Um, but, um, you know, roughly speaking, it's very Feynman diagram-like. Um, and these are the observables that are relevant for, um, for inflation or more generally these correlators are, are what you're interested in when you're trying to extract information from the sitter, okay? We're gonna calculate in a specific frame, okay? And then we're gonna treat space and time on different footing. Because we're interested in the late time behavior, basically what we, what's done in these calculations is you treat time independently and then you are gonna integrate uh, time to infinity in order to take this late time limit. And then investigate the correlations between uh, different momentum modes, three momentum modes. And one issue that happens when you just try to apply the in informalism to say phi to the fourth theory in De Sitter is that you encounter integrals which are uh, not naively regulated, for example, using DIMRAG. And so a lot of full theory calculations rely on hard cutoffs. And uh, again, as we're familiar with from standard EFT, uh, those hard cutoffs break symmetries. And so uh, they can uh, at least make the renormalization a little bit more difficult or confusing. And so one of the advantages that we'll see here uh, in the SD SCT is that we have a dim reg like way to uh, regulate our integrals. Okay, so here's what the theory looks like. Um, we start with the full theory. So this is just, for example, phi to the fourth expressed in an expanding background. Okay, so these are gravitational covariant derivatives. And um, we've done a little bit of manipulation here. So we basically just uh, don't worry about it too much, but we've rescaled time by a factor of Hubble. Uh, that makes the units uh, very manifest um, as we work our way towards the effective theory. Um, this full theory Lagrangian transforms into this soft to sitter effective theory Lagrangian when you take the long wavelength limit systematically. And what we find is that our quadratic action becomes this linear action in time, okay? And then we have a tower of higher dimension operators. Here, I haven't included any with derivatives. Um, so these are potentially operators that can be um, marginal or even in, uh, well, yeah, let me just leave it there, can, can become marginal. Um, and I'll discuss their power counting in, as we move along. Um, but notice in particular, I'm gonna make a big deal about the fact that there's no pure phi plus term here, okay? So this is the structure of the theory and I wanna explain how we get here. But first I just wanna motivate you by telling you some applications, okay? So I've, we have in the paper, we have four main applications that we discussed and uh, here each of them, I, I give each of them a slogan to help you remember, okay? So this, is, um, this will also be my conclusion slide. So um, first of all, we investigate correlators of massive scalar fields into sitter, okay? Now, massive scalar fields are expected to decay in the long wavelength limit. And sure enough, we can see that made manifest by power counting. I'll explain uh, the sense in which physics beyond the horizon is irrelevant. You only get irrelevant operators when you have massive scalar fields. Then we'll move to the case with light scalar fields, essentially massless. That's number two here, where Starobinsky's approach to stochastic inflation is, uh, is the correct way to think about the physics. Basically, you get classical drifting of the scalar field down its potential, but you can also get quantum fluctuations pushing you around the potential. And uh, we're not the first to make this connection to RG, but for us, it'll be very much just follow your nose and you're led to an RG that resums marginal operators that appear. Um, and that RG has exactly the same structure as uh, Starobinsky's formula. Then we'll make gravity dynamical. And I'll discuss briefly how to generalize things to metric fluctuations during inflation. And what we'll find is that the idea that modes freeze out during inflation is completely just a consequence of power counting. So we'll see this idea of super horizon modes freezing out. And, um, and in fact, we can apply this. Uh, so for the scalar modes that come from inflation, um, 
there are diagrammatic proofs, brute force proofs of um, of this fact. Okay, that for just is going to be a totally trivial consequence of power. Um, but we can also extend this to the tensor modes, and so uh, we arguably have shown for the first time that the tensor modes also freeze out to all orders. And then finally, I will speculate um, about applications to eternal inflation. Um, Basically, all I'll show you is very briefly is just now the structure of the EFT uh, looks a little different, at least in a case where eternal inflation should become relevant. There's a tower of relevant operators that appear in the EFT. And so there's some novel phase you would need to solve for um, because you would need to sum all those relevant operators into um, you know, what you mean by the propagator. Um, or, well, we don't know the right way to think about that. Okay. And again, this is probably not so necessary uh, to push YEFT to this audience. Um, but you know, at this point, it's probably obvious there's a ruler in the game, okay, set by the horizon. Now I'm going to work in this frame where I'm going to think about my UV scale as being the inverse co-moving horizon set by AH. And I'm going to compare that to uh, my long wavelength modes K. Okay, so I've just moved the A to the other side. That's just going to be uh, convenient for the way we set up calculations. Okay, um, and then we're going to be taking this long wavelength limit. So we're going to be in a situation with a large separation of scales between K and AH, and that'll introduce a power counting parameter, uh, and we'll be able to organize everything in terms of this lambda. And um, because time is short, I won't go into the connections to a very famous EFT of inflation. Um, but roughly speaking, it you know its validity lies in this range, and we're interested in physics down here. Okay. And just to dress up a little bit in a little bit more technical language, um, what we're going to do is first we'll isolate the propagating degrees of freedom. We'll derive their quadratic action. Um, and that will expose what symmetries are relevant in the IR. We'll show how power counting gives us the tools of dimensional analysis to organize operators. We'll be able to regulate integrals without breaking any symmetries using a generalization of DIMRAG. And it, when it's relevant, we'll be able to use uh, RG techniques to sum full theory IR logarithms. Okay. So, Here's where uh, the analogies with HQET start kicking in. Basically, the idea is just to do a mode expansion of our full theory field. So again, I think it's useful to keep in mind phi to the fourth theory. Um, so this is just some scalar field that lives in DeSitter. And we're going to split it into soft modes and hard modes. And then we're going to integrate out the hard modes. And that's going to give us a local operator expansion. So let's talk about how to isolate the soft modes. Um, here's the metric. Uh, here I'm defining this underlying T. Notice I'm going to show just a couple of formulas that uh, are actually typed out, and you'll see that this underlying T is kind of a script T in uh, those formulas. Um, but details will go by too fast to matter. Um, if you're interested, everything's in the paper. And then uh, you'll also see taus appear in, um, in some of the more complete expressions, and that's just conformal time. So if you see Ts or taus, uh, Conceptually, those are interchangeable. OK, so we just take the Klein-Gordon equation in an expanding background. Um, for an FRW-like metric, it just looks like this equation of motion here. And the long wavelength limit amounts to just setting this term to 0. OK? And then it's very straightforward to solve this differential equation. Uh, there are two solutions. So this gives us the time dependence. The classical time dependence uh, is all contained here in this prefactor, where nu can take a positive or a negative value. Okay, And notice that this parameter is set by the mass. Okay, So basically, we're going to trade the mass dependence in the full theory for uh, the parameter dependence here, the time dependence, uh, at least the leading order time dependence, in the EFT. And uh, one small apology here, I will interchangeably use nu and also alpha and beta depending on convenience where alpha and beta is constrained to be three. So that's the same amount of information. It's just um, sometimes expressions are much simpler uh, using alpha and beta versus nu. Uh, 
Okay, so we're going to identify these two solutions with the two EFT degrees of freedom. Okay, so I already introduced these verify plus and verify minus in that second slide. Um, to cosmologists, those are known as the growing and the decaying modes. Okay, um, the growing mode decays, but it decays less quickly than the decaying mode. And, um, and so we're going to just express this soft field in terms of these var phi fields where their leading order time dependence is made explicit. Okay, and again, notice alpha and beta here, which are just set by the mass and the fundamental theory and the EFT, those are uh, free parameters. Although the constraint alpha plus beta equals three, you can derive that directly within the EFT. Um, okay, so basically what we've done is we've made the leading order time dependence explicit. And that is the trick essentially to making power counting explicit as well. Okay, so now we have the degrees of freedom. And I wanna tell you about this uh, additional ingredient, which is that we need to impose stochastic initial conditions for our fields, okay? And this is a, a nice demonstration of the cartoon that we draw about how inflation works, that there are short distance quantum fluctuations that are stretched out beyond the horizon, freeze out, and that those seed structure. So we can see that pretty explicitly uh, in the following exercise, okay? Let's take our full theory quantum field and let's canonically quantize it using um, just standard techniques, okay? So we have creation and annihilation operators for a boson with some non-trivial commutator. And what De Sitter tells us and, um, and our choice of background tells us what these mode functions are. They're not plane waves in De Sitter. They're these bunch of Davies mode functions, uh, which have this dependence on Henkel functions. And uh, just to highlight, here's this tau dependence, okay? So it's really convenient to uh, express these mode functions in terms of tau, the conformal time. Um, also notice the dependence on nu here, okay? So that's how the mass uh, manifests, the full theory mass manifests in the EFT is through this nu dependence. Okay, so now we can just take the soft limit. And what we see is that our uh, operators reorganize and we basically get a common factor in front, which is this time dependence that we saw was the correct time dependence for the var five plus field okay, multiplied by just this one over uh, k to the three halves minus alpha factor, okay? And then there's some combination of the full theory creation and annihilation operators that we're gonna relabel as A tilde, and then over here for the other combination as B tilde, okay? And these are essentially the scale invariant power spectra we're familiar with from inflation, okay? So now we can just ask, what do these, new operators do for us? Well, they have trivial commutation relations, but they have non-trivial uh, two-point functions, okay? And in fact, this is essentially telling us that these are stochastic random variables. And so we can identify operators and we can compute, for example, the two-point function of the operators built out of this A tilde and B tilde fields, uh, excuse me, A tilde and B tilde uh, operators. And these fields, their two-point function uh, just gives us the classical power spectrum uh, that we expect from De Sitter. Okay, so this is all the free theory uh, at tree level. And in fact, uh, something that we're working on now is, um, is working out a matching calculation in phi to the fourth theory to, uh, to the next order. And in particular, we're really interested in understanding how matching works because you need to match these initial conditions along with just matching the parameters in the EFT Lagrangian. And uh, we believe that that can be done systematically order by order, but we're uh, demonstrating it in a concrete way using phi to the fourth theory in work in progress. Okay, so those are the building blocks. Now let's talk about uh, the SDSET itself. All right, we've already talked a lot about the degrees of freedom and the power counting. I mentioned the symmetries, we'll see them appear uh, explicitly in the slides. And we just finished talking about the initial conditions. Okay, so this is everything we need uh, to build something in close analogy with heavy quark effective theory. Here's how everything power counts, okay? So we're gonna follow the standard procedure. We're gonna enforce that our action power counts as order one in the power counting parameter. 
And space and time are treated differently here. Okay, so once you decide how they power count, everything else follows uh, from these and this, and that is, I hope, familiar to this audience. Okay, um, and in particular, our fields phi plus and phi minus power count uh, according to a power of alpha or beta, respectively. Okay, so we can see that the time dependence, the a h to the alpha that appears in front of var phi plus is, um, is essentially what governs the power counting, OK? And that can be made explicit by a combination of using power counting and, and the symmetries. Uh, it turns out that the power counting exactly tracks factors of AH. OK? So here's one of the more important uh, space-time symmetries that's inherited. It's essentially just a rescaling of coordinates. Okay, in static to sitter, you can look in the paper, we have um, additional isometry transformations that we impose. Um, but this gets you most of the way, okay, uh, just these simple rescalings. There's also a reparameterization invariance, which has to do with the fact that we split the full theory mode into multiple modes, okay. And so even within the soft sector, I can redefine phi plus and phi minus, I can shift them in this way here. Um, without changing the physics. Okay, so I need to ensure that my action is invariant under this form of RPI. And just like in HQET or SCT or other uh, familiar EFTs, RPI mixes uh, power counting. Okay, so from the top down, we just follow our nose, we plug in this for the soft field, and we combine terms. We use integration by parts. We use the equations of motion, um, which manifest in these relations for alpha similar for beta. We impose alpha plus beta equals three, and we're left. We get to this form here, okay? Um, where I'm including, uh, and this is this is just the free theory, okay? Um, next, we apply power counting, okay? So these two terms are always going to be subleading in power, and we can integrate by parts, and we can perform a field redefinition on phi minus that looks like this. And this is one of the really useful tools in this EFT is because we have phi minus around, and because we are only interested in correlators of phi plus, we're allowed to do field redefinitions on phi minus at will to simplify things, OK? Um, and this turns out to be very useful both in the free theory and then once we introduce interactions as well, you'll see. Um, OK, so we uh, everything is reduced to this simple form, OK? Um, and the last non-trivial little step is that even after you do all these manipulations, um, you're left with this term, which has two powers of time derivatives. And um, thankfully, Weinberg, in his um, original paper on in perturbation theory, encountered the same kind of effect and told us how to deal with it. He said to think of this as an interaction. Basically, the, guy, the dynamics is governed by these uh, first order time uh, derivative terms. And as we'll see, we can self-consistently see that, uh, that this term is subleading in power. OK, so we'll assume it's subleading in power. And then in a slide, I'll show you uh, that that is a self-consistent assumption. OK, so here we are. This is the free SDSET action, including uh, the, the first subleading term. OK, so notice it's suppressed by a power of AH squared. And, um, and for convenience, we've left uh, thing, the kinetic term um, with this non-canonical normalization. But of course, you can just uh, normalize that away, uh, depending on convenience. We see that. These are subleading terms, OK? So these are order lambda squared. And so to leading order, this is just 0. And by con you know, this is sort of by construction, but we're seeing everything self-consistently work out that we have that the, uh, the modes, the, the time derivative of the phi plus and the phi minus modes are 0, that the leading power solutions are constant. And then power corrections can come and give us subleading contributions. Okay, and that's, again, underlying why we can um, treat this var phi plus dot var phi minus dot term as subleading. It's because 
of these kind of relations. Um, I'll only touch on this briefly in the paper. We argue at least at one loop order uh, that integrating out the heavy modes gives us a local action. Okay, so again, as is familiar from multipole expanding in EFTs, uh, momentum conservation kills multiple terms that can appear. And so it just turns out that uh, the leading effect of integrating out the heavy mode appears at one loop. And in the paper, we, um, we provide some uh, discussion at one loop order of what it looks like to integrate out the heavy mode. And the punchline is basically that its contribution is exponentially suppressed. And so this gives us local interactions just in the same sense that integrating out the W boson uh, gives local interactions in Fermi theory. Okay, so let's talk about the interacting theory now. Um, I've at least uh, argued that it's local, so we can just write down polynomials built out of our, our fields and derivatives of our fields, and we just apply our power counting rule, okay? So we're interested in correlators of R5+. Plus. It makes sense that the, uh, the leading interaction we might be interested in is var5 plus to the nth power. However, this term can be removed by performing this field redefinition on var5 minus. And so we see that we can remove what would be potentially the leading polynomial interaction by a field redefinition. OK? So now let's talk about how these interactions power count. Now I'm going to allow for polynomials in terms of phi plus and phi minus. Okay, just using the power counting rules, they scale with this power of lambda. And what I've just argued in the last slide is that this m, the power of r phi minus, has to be greater than or equal to one. Okay, and so then we just organize in the standard way into relevant marginal and irrelevant operators depending on the power counting. So when I start to appeal to operators have, belonging to these different categories, I'm using, I'm using these power counting uh, arguments. OK, so let's come back to these polynomial interactions. And let's ask what happens for a theory with a non-trivial mass. So if the mass is appreciable compared to Hubble, that in the EFT feeds into alpha, OK? and um, so we see that alpha has, is going to lie in this range from 0 to 3 halves. That then influences our power counting because alpha appears here and beta appears here. Okay, And so when alpha is, you know, say, order 1, it's very easy to see that uh, all of our interactions are at least of order alpha and are therefore irrelevant. Okay, So this is the argument that when you have massive scalar fields into sitter, all the interactions are irrelevant. Um, and all basically, uh, all the physics dies off quickly as you take T2 infinity. Now, something special happens as we take the mass to 0. That corresponds to taking alpha to 0. And so now we see this alpha dependence here means that we can, in principle, have uh, marginal operators appear. OK, before I uh, go into the applications, uh, I just want to briefly highlight the, um, the last feature here, which is this uh, modified form of DIMREG. Basically, what happens in these calculations is you often encounter integrals of this form. OK, so we're used to this in normal DIMREG, where this would be, say, squared or to the fourth and so on, right? a fixed power. But here, because uh, the Henkel functions depend on the dimension of space-time, when you integrate over the time coordinate, uh, you end up being left with momentum integrals, three momentum integrals of this form. Okay, And so DIMREG fails. As I adjust d, I don't uh, find that this integral converges for any d, just because the numerator and the denominator scale together. Okay, So our trick is quite simple. Um, we call it dynamical DIMREG just because it's a modification of alpha, which governs the dynamics, and, um, and it sounds fancy. And so, um, but all we're doing is essentially reinstating DIMREG 
by changing the dimensions, um, by analytically continuing in this alpha, okay, we basically introduce some uh, small alpha dependence into this exponent here in the denominator, and now everything looks like dim red, okay? And so we're just analytically continuing in alpha, and then we'll take the limit back where delta alpha goes to zero, and we'll see one of our alpha poles appear, or one of our delta alpha poles will appear, and they'll be accompanied by logarithms in exactly the, the way we're used to from dim red. Okay, so that's all the nuts and bolts. We've got an action. Uh, we, I hope that at least you are um, happy that we checked that it's local, uh, and the uh, and we have this idea of initial conditions, and so um, we can just apply this to various scenarios. So let's start with um, massive scalar fields in DS. And so we've already gone through this argument that uh, all the interactions, the polynomial interactions are irrelevant. By the way, I don't think I said it explicitly, but derivative interactions are also irrelevant. They come explicitly with those powers of one over AH, as you saw in even in the free theory derivation. Um, and so that accounts for all, all the possible operators. So in the paper, we provide a variety of calculations. This is where the real detailed checks that the EFT is working um, I think are, are demonstrated. And in particular, uh, fortunately for me, Dan and his student had done a lot of these calculations in the full theory uh, uh, relatively recently. Um, they're pretty heroic calculations. And, um, and so that gave us a lot of uh, detailed data that we could attempt to match to, okay? And so in our paper, we do uh, one, even two loop calculations, uh, both for uh, the fields, but also for composite operators. And, um, and we calculate anomalous dimensions that we then, uh, and we show that we agree with the literature. Okay, so we really are capturing the IR in this massive limit. Um, and as you'll see, if you go read the details there, um, we wouldn't get the right answer without these initial conditions. Okay, so there's, there's a highly non-trivial role played by them. And in fact, we discovered we needed them by figuring out how to reproduce these calculations. Okay, so now let's turn to light scalers uh, where uh, the dynamics gets a lot more interesting. Um, so again, I already said this, as we take the mass to zero, uh, then this alpha parameter that appears in the EFT goes to zero. And our interactions, these polynomials that have phi plus to the N and one power of phi minus, all power count like order one. Okay, so these are all in the exact massless limit these are becoming, all, all these operators are becoming marginal. We have a tower of marginal operators. They, in principle, can mix under RG. The equation of motion using this interaction in the, um, in the action is simply given by this, okay? So we see that the time derivative of the var phi plus uh, is just given by a polynomial of the var phi plus, okay? So that's just the classical equation of motion comes from doing the variation with respect to var phi minus. But now we can ask about quantum corrections. Um, so let's look at composite operators built out of phi plus to the n. Again, we can ask how do they power count? Well, they all are a power count as order one for the same reason as the operators that appeared in, in the action. So we expect non-trivial RG mixing among these operators. And in fact, we find that if you contract any two legs, so you take some phi to the n, you stitch two legs together, uh, you evaluate that using the, um, the initial conditions, just the Gaussian initial conditions. So that's where this dependence comes from. Um, I didn't define it, but this C alpha is just the coefficient for the Gaussian initial conditions. Okay, and you get this relation. So uh, your operator O n, Correlator is related to a correlator of on minus two times a loop factor. Okay, um, so up to maybe factors of two. Hopefully, that's that's clear where that comes from. Okay, so now we have this integral we want to evaluate. It's both scaleless and it diverges as alpha goes to zero. Okay, but this community knows what to do. We just need to isolate the UV divergence. 
we regulate the IR in some convenient way. And then that separates the scaleless integral into a UV divergent part and an IR divergent part, which where the IR divergent part is now regulated by the regulator. The UV divergent part um, is free to be regulated by our dim reg like approach. And so if we just do the most naive thing, okay, we find that we can evaluate that integral for finite alpha. And um, as promised, right, we get a one over alpha divergence and a corresponding log of AH. So we've got logarithms. They can, in principle, become large. And so why don't we try to sum them using RG? We just take the time derivative of these uh, correlation functions right, with, it, with one of these operators ON. We have the contribution uh, from the classical equations of motion. But now we have this new contribution, which is coming from the one loop diagram. Okay, And sure enough, this RG, as has been recognized in the literature before, uh, is equivalent to the Fokker-Planck equation uh, that, that Starobinsky derived, OK? And there's a nice um, derivation of this in a recent paper by Baumgarten Sundrum, uh, where they go from this RG picture to uh, directly to the Fokker-Planck equation. Um, so I won't go into those details. Uh, it also provides me the opportunity to just advertise this nice work. Um, so uh, we like to think about uh, what Baumgarten Sundrum did as being the, um, the the sort of traditional QCD approach to resummation, uh, whereas what we did is the EFT approach to resummation. Um, so they have a very nice diagrammatic description of where this RG comes from um, by studying the, the structures in the full theory. Um, they also, by the way, in that paper named the soft desider effective theory. The last line in their paper uh, says, now we've derived all these uh, beautiful results. It'd be nice to see this captured in an EFT framework. And when it, Dan and I read that line, we said, ah, I think that's what we've been working on. And thankfully, uh, Matt and Raman were gracious enough to let us use their name. OK. So that was the application um, to in fixed sitter. Now I just want to say a few words about metric fluctuations and dynamical gravity. OK. So if we allow our metric to be dynamical, um, we can use power counting and symmetries to claim that there is no time dependence in the late time limit, OK? So this is the statement that, to all orders, the superhorizon modes during inflation freeze out. Um, so we're going to be interested in, uh, I'll just focus here on the expressions for this zeta, which are the, um, the scalar fluctuations of the metric. And the full theory quadratic Lagrangian looks like this, OK? And there are a variety of nonlinear symmetries that act on um, this zeta field. OK, so this is one example. Um, but the point is that this acts like a shift symmetry. OK, so now we have an extra symmetry that we have to account for within the EFT. We can still take the same SDSET limit of this zeta field, OK, expanding it into zeta plus and zeta minus and so on. But the key is that we need to keep track of this new nonlinearly realized symmetry. Okay. And unsurprisingly, that kills polynomial interactions. Okay. So this tells us that the only types of interactions that are allowed are interactions with derivatives so that you can respect the shift symmetry. And as we've already argued, derivatives all come with powers of 1 over AH. That tells you they're power suppressed. And so this demonstrates that at the late time limit, there are no interactions for these modes. OK? So there's full theory arguments were made at tree level in these papers to all orders uh, by my collaborator Dan and his collaborators, and then also in this paper by Senatore and Zaldariaga. Um, those papers are um, very interesting, there, but they take the in and formulas the formulation in terms of commutators, they push it as hard as they can. And the power counting is only explicit towards the end of the calculation. Okay? There are lots of factors that A can, that can appear 
and due to say commutators and um, and so you don't you can't demonstrate the time dependence um, explicitly until until the end. Okay, so those papers are of course correct, um, but here what we've seen is that the same arguments follow simply from power counting and symmetries. Okay, so EFT enthusiasts always love when we can explain. Uh, things that in the full theory seemed complicated in the simple ways that are essentially boiling down to dimensional analysis. And finally, I want to highlight that our arguments also apply to the tensor modes. So no one has technically proven to all orders that the tensor modes freeze out. We all believe that that's true. And in practice, everyone just treats that as fact. Um, but the first demonstration that this is true to all orders, at least to our knowledge, um, is is can be done using the SDSCT. OK. Um, wow, I'm doing better on time than I expected. So uh, the last thing I want to say is um, I just want to uh, tease uh, application to eternal inflation. Um, these are some very vague notions. Um, Dan and I are having fun um, thinking about this more, but uh, it's quite speculative. Um, the one thing I just want to point out is now um, you know, we're still talking about dynamical gravity, so we need to be careful to keep track of the metric dynamics, okay? So let's imagine we're just going to take the massless limit of the full theory. Um, and in that limit, it is, if the potential is flat enough, you can enter this eternally inflating regime at some, uh, at some point in the evolution, okay? Um, and for us, what we see is that that manifests in the long wavelength limit, because now, you have to be careful. G is dynamical. And so this trick we used to eliminate all of the phi r phi plus to the n's using a field redefinition, a simple re field redefinition on var phi minus, it doesn't work anymore. OK, so you cannot just simply eliminate these polynomial terms. Um, and you'll see that um, as alpha goes to 0, right? The polynomials in terms of var phi plus to the n power count as inverse powers of the power counting. That tells you that they're relevant operators, okay? And that tells you that you can't ignore them in the IR. You need some way to handle them non perturbatively, okay? So this is just a hint, but the SDSET seems to know that, um, that something different is happening um, in the case where eternal inflation might be relevant. Okay. So again, very speculative, but a lot of fun to think about. OK. Um, so I think the most important take home here is that, it, that this approach works. OK. Um, I just summarize what we did in the paper, um, partly to, you know, because it's just technical calculations. Um, but if you go look, we tried to be very explicit. Um, and, and show uh, lots of detailed steps so that you can really convince yourself, especially in this massive case where there's uh, these examples in literature to compare to, um, that this approach is working, OK? Uh, it's highly non-trivial, but we're getting the right answer in all the factors of two, OK? And so that already is very exciting. And then immediately, it points to these variety of applications. So. Um, I'll just quickly go through my slogans, and um, and I'll even probably end a few minutes early. So um, we studied massive correlators in DeSitter, and I argued that in the massive case, physics beyond the horizon is irrelevant. All of the interactions that could appear are irrelevant. Okay. Um, we then moved to the massless limit, and we saw that Starobinsky's picture for stochastic inflation was forced upon us because we encountered a tower of marginal operators uh, with large logarithms. And so we needed to resum them using RG techniques. And that led us to uh, the Starobinsky equations, at least in their RG form. Then we allowed gravity to become dynamical. And we saw that we could apply these approaches to metric fluctuations during inflation, and in particular, uh, a simple consequence of power counting is this very important fact that superhorizon modes freeze out, um, which is, again, part of the story that we tell everyone about how inflation works. And then finally, I speculated that there might be 
uh, applications to questions of eternal inflation. And in particular, I just showed that uh, at least in principle, uh, now a tower of relevant operators appear in the limit where eternal inflation should be relevant. And so there should be a novel phase of the DSET um, and that remains to be worked out. Okay, um, so I'll stop there.